Good morning, everybody. I'm so happy to be here with you all this morning. My name is Trisha Patterson, and I'm a part of the teaching team here at Anthem. My husband, Sam, and I have been attending here for a while now with our girls, Joy and Ellie, and we just feel like Anthem is home. And I'm praying that if this is your first time here, that you'll feel that way as well. We just pray that you feel like you are welcome, you're at home, and you belong here because you do. And we know that God brought you here for a reason, and that's true for every single one of you here today. So today we are going to be in Psalm 32. It's a really rich psalm, and I'm super excited about it. And the title of my message is The Surprising Secret to Happiness. And I'm going to be answering the question, what is keeping me from true happiness? What is keeping all of us from true happiness? And I know sometimes when we talk about happiness, it can seem kind of trite. Happiness feels very elusive sometimes. And I know that many of you probably walked in here today and you are feeling the heaviness of life, the reality of life, and there's a lot of tragedy in life. And sometimes when someone throws out the word happiness, you think, well, how could I feel happy? But what we're talking about today is so much deeper than the happiness you might be thinking about. It is a deep contentment and joy that we can only experience through Jesus Christ. So I just wanted to lay that out there as we begin talking about happiness. This is something deeper than I think any of us could really even imagine, the happiness that God intends for our lives. So before we jump in today, I just want to pray over all of us and pray for myself as well that the Spirit would come and be among us. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, we just invite you into this place. We know that you are here, God. We're just in awe of who you are. After singing and worship, Lord, I just, I just cannot even fathom your love. That you would send your son, Jesus, for us. We're so undeserving that he would become Emmanuel for us. God with us. We're so grateful, God. And I just pray that none of us ever take that for granted, that we never forget just the gravity and the weight of what you did for us on the cross, Lord. I pray that we are reminded daily of the gospel and that it never gets old to us, Lord, but that every day we wake up in awe of the way that you loved us for sending Jesus. We love you, God. We give you this time. I pray, Lord, that you will speak through me because I'm nothing on my own. I need you, Lord. I pray that these words in this psalm come alive to all of us. It's in your glorious and precious name, the name of Jesus, that we pray. Amen. So I've mentioned before that my husband, Sam, is a college basketball coach. He's taking our daughter to Sunday school. He's a college basketball coach, and he coaches at Oral Roberts University. But before we moved here, he coached at Baylor University. And his first season, yes, yeah, Sikkim Bears, one Sikkim Bears, that's awesome. Uh, we got all the OU and OSU people in here. I'm surprised we got the one Sikkim. But he, he coached at Baylor University. And uh, if you know the story of Baylor, they were the underdog of all underdogs many years ago in men's basketball. And actually, Sam's first season with the Baylor men's basketball team, they only won one game. But in his last season with the Baylor men's basketball team, they were ranked number one in the nation. And it was fun to watch Sam, through those years, experience such a great joy when he, when he realized, hey, we're moving towards success. He had this great joy because he had experienced the one win season. So when they made it to number one in the nation, he really appreciated that moment. Now, some of the younger guys who joined the program later in the years when they joined the program, they weren't quite as appreciative when they won games or became number one. They thought that it was something that they deserved. They, they became a little more entitled. Have you ever seen this before? So Sam 
was just joyful, excited when they had made all that progress because he knew they had once been the underdog. But these other guys, they had taken this for granted because they thought they deserved it and they were entitled. And that's what a lot of us tend to do with our salvation. I think sometimes we just don't realize exactly where we came from, and so we don't fully appreciate where we are now and the victory that we have in Jesus. So I don't know where all of you are this morning as you enter into this place. We all come from different backgrounds, but one thing I do know, we all started on an even playing field when it comes to sin. We all were the ultimate underdog, up against the wall, no victory in sight. We were slaves to sin, but Jesus made the way for us. And there is no way we could have had victory apart from Jesus. And that's what this psalm is about today. Psalm 32 is about the joy that we experience when we truly understand where we came from. So that's what I'm going to try to do today to help us see where we came from so that we can fully appreciate the joy of our salvation. So let me read Psalm 32 with you. Psalm 32, it says, Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. For when I kept silent about my sin, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. We can resonate with that, David. Finally, I acknowledged my sin to you, and I did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Therefore, let everyone who is godly offer prayer to you at a time when you may be found. Surely in the rush of great waters, they shall not reach him. You are our hiding place. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with shouts of deliverance. Then the Lord begins to speak and he says, I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. Be not like a horse or a mule without understanding, which must be curved with bit and bridle, or it will not stay near you. Many are the sorrows of the wicked, but steadfast love surrounds the one who trusts in the Lord. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, O righteous, and shout for joy, all you upright in heart. There's so much here, but there are going to be four questions that we really focus on as we go through this psalm today. And those four questions are, what brings true happiness? What keeps us from true happiness? What's the surprising secret to true happiness? And what's the experience of true happiness? So first, let's tackle that first question, what brings true happiness? And we find that in verses 1 and 2, where it said, Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiveness, who, who is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity. Pastor Brad talked about this word blessed when he taught on Psalm 1. It was used there. And the Hebrew of this word means happy. Happy is the one whose transgression is forgiveness. Pastor Brad said, humanity is not on a quest for truth, but on a search for happiness. Isn't that true? Those who are truly happy are the ones who find their life in God. And that's what we're going to look at today. How can we fully find our life in God? Because that is the only place where we will find true happiness. So this word here, blessed, means happiness. Happy is the one whose transgression is forgiveness, forgiven, whose sin is covered. Why is it that that person is happy? 
Is it just because their guilt is dissolved, they have a clear conscience? Well, those are benefits of having our sins forgiven, but that is not why we're happy. The reason that we are happy is so much deeper here. And what's happening here when there's forgiveness and our sin is covered is that fellowship with God, the God that we were made for, is restored. What this psalm is telling us is that there was a breakdown somewhere, a breakdown in our relationship with God. And I I love this quote. It says, you were made by God and for God. And until you understand that, life will never make sense. So if you're walking in here and you just feel like life doesn't make sense, I want to tell you why. It's because you were made by God and for God. And there's a breakdown in that relationship. And that's why we're unhappy. And even for those of us who know Jesus Christ, sometimes we can feel unhappy in this relationship. And what I think it might be is that the closeness of our relationship isn't what it should be. We might have a relationship with Jesus Christ, but true happiness is when we're in that close relationship with him because that is what we were made for. So that's the big idea of Psalm 32 is to be in close relationship with God is true happiness. It sounds trite, but it's not at all. This is the deepest truth that we can come to know in life, that we were made for relationship with God. So how do we get there? My deepest desire as I was praying for you this week, I just really prayed that the Lord, by his grace, would show every single one of us that he truly does intend for us to live a blessed life, a happy life. And it's hard for us to really believe that sometimes. I don't know. Is it hard for you? It's hard for me sometimes to think, God, do you really intend for me to live a happy life? But he does. He wants us to live this blessed life, and he knows that it only happens through Jesus Christ. And I want to be completely clear today. Blessedness and happiness is not connected to wealth, health, circumstances, or material things. It's not connected to any of those things that the world tells you will give you happiness. But happiness is only connected to one thing, and that is closeness to the God that we were made for. You know, my testimony is that I became a Christian when I was seven years old. So I've, I've walked with the Lord most of my life, but... I feel like the theme of my life is this line from Come Thou Fount. Y'all know that hymn? One of the lines says, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it, prone to leave the God I love. I deeply love God, but I also see the sin within me that makes me prone to wander. Time and time again in my life, I felt myself wandering away from the God that I loved. I thought, well, maybe on the search for happiness, I can actually find happiness through that relationship or that job or making that amount of money or if I fit into that size of jeans or if I look this certain way or if I have that new house, that might make me happy. I mean, these are actual things that I have really sought after in my life to find happiness. And over and over again, by the loving grace of God, he pulls me back and he reminds me, that's not going to satisfy, Trish. That is not where you will find happiness. And I just hope that today, as we open up the word of God, that you will see that that is true. We have these wandering hearts and we're going after all these different things And I don't know what it is for you. It's different for all of us. The things that we seek to find this happiness that all of us desire. But the only way we are going to be truly blessed, truly happy, is if we come to the one that we were made for. So I want to ask you the question, what's your status with God? What's the status of your relationship with God? And that's a question 
for you, if you're walking in here and you don't even really know who this Jesus person is, you don't know why you even ended up here. And that's a question for you if you've been walking with Jesus for 30 years. Because many of us can get in this mode of just going through the motions. And the closeness that we once had with Jesus, the joy of our salvation that we are supposed to experience is no longer there. And I want us to examine our hearts today and see what is the actual status of our relationship with God. So what's the second question? The second question is what keeps me from being truly happy? And the short answer that we find in this psalm is sin. I know we don't like to talk about sin, but the answer is sin. That's what keeps us from being truly happy because that is what drives the wedge between our hearts and the heart of God, the one that we were made for. It was sin that created this chasm between us and a holy God. I don't know if you've ever been in a relationship with someone, maybe your husband or your wife or a friend or a family member, and have you ever had something drive a wedge in that relationship? Maybe you got in a fight, a disagreement. I know that's happened to me in my marriage. And when you have that wedge in your relationship, you just can't seem to have that closeness that's meant to be there, right? There's this elephant in the room, and you just won't deal with it. And maybe you try to go through the motions and act like everything's okay in that relationship, but in reality, you know that it's just a fraud. And that's many of us in our relationship with God. The closeness isn't there. The friendship isn't there that's meant to be there. The happiness isn't there. The enjoyment, the freedom that we're meant to have in our relationship with God isn't there. And it's because there's this elephant in the room. And that is sin. And it has to be dealt with. And until it's dealt with, we won't experience the closeness that we are meant to experience with God. So here in Psalm 32, there are words like, your transgressions, your sin, your iniquity. All of these words are talking about kind of that rebellion that all of us have, that we inherited from the fall. All of us were born with this sinful nature that we are prone to wander. We are prone to get off the path. And we all have this iniquity, the guilt that comes along with sin. And I'm sure that you've experienced that before. And I want to be clear, the only reason that I'm coming up here and talking about sin is not to hit you over the head. Nobody likes that. But it's so that we will love our Savior even more. And so that we can come into restored relationship with him. I know we don't like the word sin. But we're a little more comfortable with the word brokenness, right? And we can all resonate with brokenness. We all know that something is broken and it needs to be fixed. We experience that in ourselves. We see the brokenness in ourselves. We see the brokenness in others, the brokenness in relationship. We, we feel the brokenness of this world. I mean, just this week, I heard several stories of families who lost family members in tragic ways. This world is broken and we all feel like it's not supposed to be this way. So what was broken? Let's rewind to the moment when everything was broken and that's in Genesis 3. So if you want to turn with me, you can. Otherwise, let me read some of these verses to you and set the stage for you. Here in Genesis 3, you find Adam and Eve and they have been walking in perfect harmony with God in the Garden of Eden, the place that he created for them to live in perfect relationship with him. But in Genesis 3, Satan enters in, he presents temptation, and Adam and Eve sin. And at that very moment, immediately, there was broken relationship with God, separation from God. The holy God who cannot be in communion with sin it, we were broken from him. That wedge was caused. That chasm came in. 
And let me read these verses from Genesis 3, 7 through 10 to show you the repercussions of sin that we have all experienced. It says, Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. Right there we see guilt enter in. They knew that they were naked, so they tried to cover themselves up. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, just as he did in the days before when they walked together. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Right there, shame entered it into the picture. And then next it says, But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid. Fear enters in, because I was naked and I hid myself. So three repercussions of sin that we see right here, guilt, shame, and fear, immediately enter into the picture. And so I know that many of you walking in here today were probably feeling some kind of heaviness from guilt, shame, or fear. And these are all because of the sin that entered in and when our relationship with God was broken. And it's so interesting because Adam and Eve take the fig leaves, trying to cover themselves. And this was the first barrier between our hearts and the heart of God. The first barrier that we began to put up, trying to hide ourselves from God. And from Adam and Eve to the present day, we're all trying to put up some kind of covering, some kind of barrier, because we know that there's guilt, there's something broken, and we need to be fixed. I know that I have felt voices of condemnation over my life, and I'm sure that you have too, voices like, you're an imposter, you're a fraud, you're not good enough, you're a fool, you're a coward, you're not living up, you're not measuring up. Have you ever felt or heard one of those voices of condemnation? That's why we all know we need a covering. Something is broken in us. We need to be made whole. But sadly, we turn to these false coverings like Adam and Eve did, the fig leaves. And some of the ways we try to cover up our sin, maybe through excuses or justifying our actions, maybe blame shifting, which is what Adam and Eve did. They pointed to one another. They pointed to the serpent. And that's what we do with our sin. We say, well, if you knew the family that I grew up in, or if you knew what they did to me, we blame shift. We do other coverings like comparison. Well, I'm not as bad as that person. Am I the only one guilty of that? And we cover ourselves up saying, well, they're way worse, so I must be okay. Or we just try to hide ourselves and act like nothing's wrong, nothing's going on, I'm not going to acknowledge it. And that's another false covering, the fig leaves. But what I want to offer you today is the true covering. And that is the blood of Jesus Christ. The only way that we can truly be covered the only voice who can silence all the other voices of condemnation and say, like from Romans 8, therefore there is now no condemnation. That should be like sweet nectar to your ears to hear that there is no condemnation over you. So if you walked in here feeling the heaviness of condemnation or guilt, I'm praying that you will walk out of here feeling this lifted spirit saying, there is now no condemnation because of what Jesus Christ did for me on the cross. And his blood is the only covering. And so if you're sitting here and you're thinking, I've always known I needed a covering. I've always tried to hide. The covering that you need is Jesus Christ. And in Psalm 32, it says that our sin is covered. And what I want you to know is that is not like a concealment of sin. That is where sin has been dealt with, where the price has been paid, a price that we could not pay. Jesus' blood 
covered us and paid the price that we could not pay. And that is the greatest news that we could ever hear. And that is the joy of our salvation that we are supposed to live in. That we no longer have to live bound to sin, but we can live free in Christ because of the payment that he paid on the cross. And we should rejoice in that. It says that our sin is covered, our transgressions are forgiven. And that word forgiven means to be lifted. And I love that picture. We should be lifted because we are forgiven. And we desperately need to be lifted because just like David in verses 3 and 4, some of us are walking in the heaviness of our sins. In verses 3 and 4, it says, For when I kept silent about my sin, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. Right here we see David in the unhappiness that sin causes, right? That heaviness. David is such an interesting character in the Bible. He's this man who's described as a man after God's own heart. And I've always wondered, how can a man be described as a man after God's own heart when he's so prone to sin? He was a murderer. He was an adulterer. He was a liar. I mean, he did what we consider the big sins. But God said, that's a man after my own heart. Why? Because he took his sin seriously. He was sensitive to his sin. He knew that his sin injured his relationship with God. And he was in turmoil when his heart was not near to God. He had experienced that closeness with God. And so when sin entered the picture and caused that wedge, that barrier between his heart and God's, he could not live with himself. He felt this heaviness of sin. But what I want to encourage you with is that if you are feeling a heaviness of sin, that is the grace of God on your life. If you feel heavy conviction, be grateful for it because that shows you God is working in your life. He is pulling you back to himself. When you were prone to wonder, he says, come back to me. You can still be a man, a woman, after my own heart. Just come back to me. That's what he desires for you. And I want to be like David, who was sensitive to sin, who felt the heaviness of his sin. That is a gift from God. I remember back when I was a teenager, and this might seem like a silly example, but when I was a teenager, I felt this kind of heaviness in the greatest way that I ever have in my entire life. When I was 14, I lied to my mom and dad, and I asked my mom to take me to a movie theater to go to the movies with some girlfriends. But I really met a boy up there at the movie theater. And then my mom came and she picked me up. I didn't tell her the truth, and I kept this a secret for months. And I remember going to our youth camp and trying to worship, and I couldn't worship because I felt this heaviness of sin on me. It was causing this barrier between my heart and God's. I just couldn't worship. And I knew right then I'm going to confess this to my mom and dad as soon as I get home so that I can relieve myself of this and have that closeness to God again. And I know you might be thinking, that is such a small example. Or maybe you're thinking, man, you're a really bad teenager. I wasn't, I promise. But, but what I'm trying to say is I'm so grateful that I felt that heaviness of sin on my life then because I have done everything I can to not feel that again. Because I experienced what it was like to have that injured relationship with God, the closeness was gone, and I couldn't live in that place. So I pray that all of you will ask God to give you that kind of sensitivity to sin because you won't live a happy life if you are living in sin. So sin 
is the problem that keeps us from being happy. So what's the surprising secret to finding true happiness? We find that in verse 5. And the answer is confession. And I know that doesn't sound like a very fun answer, but that is the key to finding true happiness. It's confession. In verse 5, David says, Finally, I acknowledged my sin to you, and I did not cover my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Sometimes we read a line like that, and we just go past it, but y'all, God forgave the iniquity of his sin, wiped his record clean when he came before him and acknowledged his sin, took full responsibility of his sin, turned from his sin, because repentance is always a part of confession. Confession is when we look at our sin and we see it from God's perspective. We agree with him. We say, yes, I see that sin. I acknowledge it. I take full responsibility for that sin. I repent of that. And it's not just being kind of sorry about your sin. What repentance means is you turn from it and you are repulsed by your sin because you know what it does to a perfect God. You're repulsed by your sin. And then this is the best part. All of that leads to reconciliation. And that's what we were made for. Restored relationship, closeness with God. So then David in verse 6 invites all of us into this. He says, therefore, if this is true, let everyone who is godly pray while there is time, while you can be found. We are called to enter into this confession. We're invited into this. So what does this mean for us? We need to see our sin. We need to see where we came from. Like Ephesians 2 says, We need to recognize that we were dead. We were doomed forever. All of us, doesn't matter how good you think you've been, doesn't matter how bad you think you've been, all of us had this fate. And until we understand that, we won't truly appreciate the joy of our salvation. We were dead. We were doomed. But God, two of the most powerful words in Scripture, but God, who is so rich in his mercy, sent Christ Jesus to make us alive while we were still dead and couldn't do anything for ourselves. He sent Jesus to make us alive. Jesus came to bridge that gap with his outstretched arms on the cross. He was bridging the gap that our sin had made, that chasm that had been caused because of sin. Jesus made the way so we no longer had to be separated from our holy God. That is the greatest news for all of us. So what does that mean for us who are believers? We've done this. We've confessed our sin and we've we've done what 1 John 1, 9 says. If we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. I want to be clear. That is a once for all time forgiveness. Once you're saved, you're always saved. You are secure in that salvation. But what we find from David is that confession is still a continual part of the life of a believer. And it's a very important part. Continual confession and repentance should be at the center of the life of a believer. It's not in that place that we secure our salvation. That's secured by what Jesus Christ did on the cross. And if we ever try to add anything to that, we're diminishing the completed work of what Christ did on the cross. But confession is that continual recognition of our sins so that we can come to that place of closeness, that happiness where we're meant to be. So experiencing the joy of your forgiveness is contingent upon a lifestyle of continual confession and repentance. And notice I said experiencing the joy of your salvation, not experiencing your salvation. You can experience that if you come before Christ, you recognize I'm in need of a Savior, you will experience salvation. 
But if you want to experience the joy of your salvation all the days of your life, then repentance, confession, better be a continual part of your life. That's what David means in Psalm 51 when he says, Restore to me the joy of my salvation. He knew he had sinned and it needed to be restored. Something was causing that barrier. He was no longer happy. He was feeling the heaviness of his sin because he needed to come before God and confess. As we begin to close, I want to tell you a story, recent story, of when I experienced this joy of my salvation being restored. Do you all remember the Dangerous Prayers series? And Pastor Brad taught on God Search Me. And I don't know if you're anything like me, but sometimes when I come before God to confess, I just confess kind of the easy, obvious things. I had a bad attitude yesterday. I confess that, Lord, thank you for forgiving me. I was impatient with my daughter. Thank you for forgiving me. But after that sermon, I came before the Lord in my prayer closet, and I said, Lord, search me. Uncover whatever I'm trying to hide from you. Uncover it. And as I came before him, he revealed to me that I have been withholding forgiveness in a relationship. And I realized that this, this way that I was withholding forgiveness was causing a barrier between my heart and the heart of God. I wasn't as close to him as I really wanted to be because of that. And I had to make that right. And he reminded me, he said, Trish, how can you withhold forgiveness from someone when I have poured it out so freely on you? And so I went to this person and I made it right. And I'm telling you, before I confessed my sin, I literally felt aching in my body, physically was affected, mentally was affected. There was that barrier. I couldn't fully hear the voice of God. My strength was sapped like David describes here. But after I confessed, I felt lifted, which is what this word forgiveness means, lifted. I felt safe in the presence of God, which is what David describes when he says, for you are my hiding place. I felt surrounded by his love rather than disconnected from it. These are the benefits and the blessings that we experience as the blessed ones. They're outlined here in verses 7 through 11. He says, you're my hiding place. You protect me. You preserve me. You surround me. And when I decided to come before God in that place of confession, I stopped acting like the horse and the mule that's described here, the stubborn one who's having to be dragged by God. But I lifted up my heels and I ran to him. And it's so much better to be in that place than acting like the horse or the mule, unwilling to come before God and be honest about our sin. But when we do that, you will find the joy of your salvation. You will experience the happiness that only he can bring. So in closing, I want to invite you into this divine exchange that we see David go through here in the psalm to trade in the heaviness that you are carrying for this upright spirit that's talked about here in verse 11. He will trade that heaviness for an upright spirit, that turmoil of sin for the rest of forgiveness. Isaiah 61 talks about this. And in Isaiah 61, it says, you'll get beauty for the ashes, a garment of praise for your heaviness, liberty for the captives, freedom for prisoners. This is what I want us to find from this psalm. God desires to lift you from a burdened posture of heaviness and unrest to an upright posture of forgiveness and joy. That's what he intends for your life. So if you're ready to make that trade, make today that day. I promise you, you will experience the joy of this forgiveness that I've described. Will you all stand to your feet with me? I want to pray over us. And I don't know where you are today. 
I don't know if this is the first time that you've been introduced to Jesus, the first time that you've heard about this, but if you have never crossed the line of faith and today you're sitting there, you feel the conviction of your sin, you're saying, I want to know this one Jesus who can make the way for me, who can bring me the joy that I've been searching for, I want to introduce you to him. He will make the way for you. He is the one that you were created for. Just invite him into your life today. And if you're a believer standing here today and you feel like you just have been living a life in sin, disconnected from God, maybe you have some unconfessed sin that's lingering on your heart and you just know, you can feel that heaviness of his hand, which is his grace, laying on your heart to get this right so you can live in closeness with him. I beg you, do that today. Like David says, while there is still time, while your heart is still sensitive to hear that voice, deal with it today. And if you're a believer in here and you are living in the joy of your salvation, I want you to just rejoice in that, in this time of response. I want you to think about what he has done for you. Live in the shouts of deliverance. Be surrounded by his unconditional love, like this song says. Live there, and you will find the happiness that you're searching for.